The first episode of the sixth season of Black Mirror, entitled Joan is Awful, is a variation on the your whole life is fake trope. It's an inverted version of the 1961 Twilight Zone episode, A World of Difference. The 1989 Twilight Zone episode, Special Service. And the 1998 motion picture, The Truman Show. But it is even more similar to the 1968 short film, The Secret Cinema. Both Joan is Awful and The Secret Cinema tell the story of an otherwise anonymous office worker whose life is being turned into entertainment behind her back. In the case of The Secret Cinema, a secretary named Jane discovers that she is being filmed during the day and that the most embarrassing highlights are being projected in a local movie theater at night. In Joan is Awful, Joan's phone is recording her every move, and then a supercomputer is generating a Netflix original series based on her life, only with deep fakes of celebrities playing all the parts. In The Secret Cinema, the humiliation of Jane leads to the main character's destruction as she confronts a mad psychiatrist behind the plot and is sent to a mental hospital in a straitjacket in the final reel. In Jonah's Awful, public humiliation and being placed under house arrest is presented as Joan's ticket to redemption and back to normality. Hello, Sublation Media viewers. It's me again, Douglas Lane. And in this episode of Diet Soap, I'll be talking to David Shields, the author of our forthcoming title, How We Got Here. Melville plus Nietzsche divided by Allen times the square root of Bloom times Zizek squared equals Bannon. The subtitle is the equation that explains fake news. It is the equation that Shields believes explains how what's called Western thought has led us all to an impasse wherein we can't easily distinguish the true from the fake, a world wherein the entire notion of truth is suspect. And in this video, I'll be using the Black Mirror episode, Joan is Awful, to illustrate a few of the key ideas from David Shields' book. The entirety of the uncut interview will be available for patrons, so look for it on Patreon. Well, it's a very, you know, one has heard of the version where, you know, a book is adapted into a film. But I think this is, this. I don't know if this is the first, probably not the first, but a relatively rare occurrence in which the book is adapted from the movie you know that that we know that you know somebody writes gone with the wind and it becomes a movie but it's rare that the movie becomes the book and if i'm totally honest and you know doug the you and i can talk about this part of it but um you know basically the movie came first that i i had to do a huge amount of research in order to do the book along with my my collaborators and research assistants and film editors and everybody else. But the thread of the film that I'm perhaps most interested in and most proud of is what I call the Melville to Bannon thread, you know, how we got from Herman Melville saying, you know, God is everywhere, i.e. nowhere to, you know, basically Giuliani, which is sort of the punchline of the book and the, the movie saying truth isn't truth. How, you know, indeed, how, how did we get here? Shield's book begins with a quote from Socrates. The only true wisdom is knowing you know nothing. The Black Mirror episode, Jonah's Awful, explores what it is that has replaced truth in our contemporary moment. It explores the societal ramifications of living on the basis of narratives, or to bring it down to the personal level, on the basis of reputation, instead of on the basis of truth. Joan is Awful illustrates how something has changed over the last few decades. We can see the change by comparing the Black Mirror episode to the earlier Truman Show. The Truman Show is about a real person who is living in the artificial world of television against his will. Whereas Joan is Awful turns out to be the story of a fake person whose real life has been turned into a television show against her will. On The Truman Show, the people in Truman's life are actors hired by the television network to play the parts of a wife or a father or a best friend. In Jonah's Awful, every fake person is also real and they are all being secretly recorded by their smartphones while a quantum computer uses AIs and deep fakes to generate a televisual story centering around the titular character, Joan. In The Truman Show, 
The audience is out there on the other side of the screen. In the real world. In Jonah's Awful, the audience, the real world, and the television show are all one thing. The real world has disappeared right along with the sets, lights, and cameras. Everything is simply a life led by algorithm, at least at the level where we viewers are originally introduced to the characters. The question of reality, of truth, is missing or an afterthought in Jonah's Awful. It's a question that is buried under the more obvious ramifications of a world wherein the private realm has disappeared, or as Zizek would put it paradoxically, where our private lives become public in such a way that we are only left with private lives that are directed or managed by networks of control and authority. Networks of control that have become invisible or gone unnoticed. To put it differently, to put it the way David does, we are no longer sure what we believe, but only work to make sure that nobody believes the wrong thing about us. In your film, you asked th these academics and uh, nonfiction writers at the conference, you started out by asking, how do you know what you believe? And what I noticed, and perhaps this is, you can explain why this happened to me, but I, I noticed that they didn't tend to answer that question. They instead often enough would tell you what they believed or uh, uh and they they would not answer the question how they knew what they believed and that and i thought that was really an interesting response to your question and it was indicative of something because they would say sometimes they would say uh yeah they would answer they would say things like um oh they they have an intuition they can feel through their bodies what is true um they do it like a gut check sounding a little bit like george w bush there you know? <laughs> i feel it in my gut yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah. right you're supposed um, to hear that echo i mean the book i mean the film is so complicated and it's but anyway sort of yeah but these are all these up. are all good democrats they're not they're not uh you know neocon uh republicans um and and they and they are yeah so and I expect their beliefs are very different but th than what George W. Bush said he believed at that time. Um, but what do you make of the fact that nobody said something like, "Well, I can know what I believe simply by taking an inventory of my beliefs," but what I can't do is immediately know the truth or know what I really know. Mm -hmm. One way to know the truth or have knowledge is to attempt to doubt my beliefs and find out what it is that I can't doubt. Right. And then what I can't doubt must be true. That's a basic Cartesian yeah. approach to trying to find a true sound right. beliefs right. Uh, that are not simply assertions. But but no one no one was attracted to that approach. Why do you think you didn't receive that kind of answer from anyone at the conference? You no, know, it's a great question. And I think you, you know, you <clears throat> you homed in in a good way on my the specificity of my question i didn't say what do you believe or how do you i specifically did say how do you know what you believe and you know it's <clears throat> these people some of them are friends some of them are colleagues some of them are literary acquaintances former students former you know so their fellow writers teachers practitioners theorists of this rather odd term, creative nonfiction, you know, people who try to write literary nonfiction. Which is, you do, you do that. Yeah, that's pretty often. much me. And I've written, you know, 20 books and the huge majority of them would fall under that broad rubric of what I call book length essay, which is what, how we got here is, but sometimes, you know, it's called poetic essay or lyric essay, creative nonfiction. And indeed in this area has been bedeviled. That's really what my most well-known book, Reality Hunger, comes out of a kind of crisis of of nonfiction. You know, the whole James Fry thing. The uh, mm -hmm. what was that case in uh, uh, J.T. Leroy? You know, like basically, I felt like the whole conversation around truth, nonfiction, in the first decade of the of the twenty first century was badly mismanaged the kind of forerunner, frankly, to the 2016 and 2020 elections, the very issues that bedeviled 
the so-called crisis of nonfiction and journalism, fact, nonfiction and truth are the very issues now that we're haunted by in the political discourse. So in a way, I've been haunted by this for a very long time, are the very issues that my book, Reality Hunger, tries to address the very issues that are bedeviling current political discourse? And I would say yes. So, In his book, Reality Hunger, David Shields argued that the division between fiction and memoir, along with the divide between originality and plagiarism, should be erased or tossed aside. He wrote, reality-based art hijacks its material and doesn't apologize. According to Wikipedia, the literary critic James Douglas Graham Wood criticized Shields' book, Reality Hunger, in this way. The book is highly problematic and its unexamined promotion of what he insists on calling reality over narrative. But if reality hunger left the question of reality unexamined, Shields is making up for this omission now. His new book, How We Got Here, explores how reality is never simply a matter of bare facts or certainties. On the flip side, uh, on the side of, I'm going to say, the Democratic Party, right. um, the reaction has been to retreat to the realm of the fact. Exactly. Um, but it, over the course of the years since Trump was elected and then lost, um, the fact checker has come under scrutiny and has been shown not only to be biased, but to be working in concert with uh, censorship efforts um, that uh, that were created by the Department of Homeland Security and and the Global Engagement Center, and um, and amongst other organizations. So you have fact checkers, for instance, uh, correcting Seymour Hirsch on the question of the Nord Stream pipeline. So he writes an investigative piece, quoting intelligence um, uh, officers uh, who anonymously tell him that the United States was very much involved with the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline, the U.S. security state was, and some Finnish fact-checking group is promoted by Facebook as being uh, able to correct Seymour Hirsch as an agent of misinformation. And if you try to post a link to his article, uh, you're told you're sharing misinformation and that not only will that post be su suppressed, but you your posts in the future will be algorithmically suppressed. So um, so the fact checkers, I mean, and clear clearly now we know that at the very least the Ukrainian government was involved. Some aspects of the Ukrainian government was involved. That's come out since then, since Seymour Hersh was suppressed. And the question of who actually destroyed the Nord Stream pipeline is still an open one. You know, what, what exactly happened there is not clear, just as the question of who killed JFK isn't right. resolved, right? So um, so this idea that we can simply retreat to facts seems as, uh, it, it seems like fake news to me, you know? <laughs> like, I, mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I agree. One doesn't want to resort to every quote, conspiracy but i think your point is an excellent one doug which is that just saying well that we can argue about truth as a relativistic debate but that somehow facts are real that that doesn't get us anywhere the facts can e equally be run through a distortion machine from the left right and center i it, it gets very very complicated and as you pointed out at the beginning this is the enlightenment legacy that is both you know thrilling and useful and takes us away from the authority of religion and state but also creates you know a kind of radical subjectivity and um you know the book and film mean to problematize this i think um you know i don't know if you want like i think that you asked me at one point you know what to explain the subtitle. And I think that's not a bad way of talking about yeah, it. Yeah, let's do is, that. You know, that, um, you know, I think of, you know, part of it is supposed, you know, I, one could come up with different equations. You know, one could say Nietzsche plus Derrida divided by Alan Bloom times Zizek 
squared equals banner, but somehow no Melville, peach is better. Yeah, I mean, but, I mean, wait, yeah, did Melville plus plus yeah. uh, Derrida, or did you say Nietzsche plus Derrida? Anyway. Yeah, I was, but anyway, that you know, I think Melville to me announces. I mean, this is rather broad and rather generalized and huge capitalized ideas, and obviously one could get into the weeds on all these, but basically the argument of the book and the film is that in many ways, Melville, you know, announces the death of God. He sees God everywhere. He's a kind of pantheist, and in that way, one, if God is everywhere, if he's in a tree, if he's in a bush, is if he's in a slice of whale blubber, you know, is there a sense in which this is announcing the death of God, which I think of as the sort of secret text of Mel, uh, of Moby Dick. It's not even terribly secret at this point. Everybody knows that's what that book's about, or at least most people read it that way. So Melville, to me, equals the death of God. Nietzsche equals the death of truth. Alan Bloom is a crucial figure in the 1980s, who who writes the book, The Closing of the American Mind, and I believe 1987, which is a, a critique from the right, the center right, from, ac from the academic side of things that look at how philosophers, how the left, how deconstruction has ruined our children's intellectual lives. They These students, these children, no longer believe in truth. They no longer believe in the good, the beautiful. They no longer believe in God. And it becomes, interestingly, part of the 1990, the, the 1988 and 1992 presidential election as people like Patrick Buchanan and uh, George Will and Lynn Cheney and William Bennett sort of use it sometimes successfully, sometimes not successfully, as a sort of talking point of, you know, the Democrats are in bed with, you know, sort of the death of God, the death of truth, the death of the, the U.S. Constitution. And then I sort of use Zizek Square, Slavo Zizek, as somebody who, why is Zizek squared? He's, you know, I think one could say, well, back, one could say Werner Herzog, someone who wants to embrace ecstatic truth. He's sort of a transitional figure between Alan Bloom in 1987 and Steve Bannon in 2016. Some well-known philosopher who, in a way, I don't know, you know Zizek both personally and philosophically better than I do, but to me, I'm trying to ask the question, how do we get from... 1987, closing of the American mind, the American right wing railing against deconstruction to rather brilliantly um, kidnapping deconstruction and using it as political theater, political strategy. And I, I do think certain sort of charismatic figures of uh, uh, Michel Welbeck, Slavo Zizek, Werner Herzog become a kind of, in some strange way, I think of the political right, learning from the chaos that such philosophers mm -hmm. um, embrace philosophically. Uh, I think of the, the political right using those. Once again, Shill's book is called How We Got Here, and as the publisher, I interpret the designation of here to be this moment when our radical subjectivity is under siege, not accidentally as a product of the culture, but explicitly and publicly as a known policy of the state. Worse, it is a moment wherein our sense of subjectivity and our recourse to public reason is slipping further and further away. To describe this moment as if it was a Black Mirror episode, it is a time wherein the mechanisms of control are not only something we sign up for and are entertained by, but further, where our sense of self has come to rely on these instruments of control. Without any recourse to truth or public understanding, without the freedom necessary to think for ourselves individually and together, we are left with the problem of how to become the main character in our own lives. Self-authorship is the aim rather than self-discovery. 
or discovery of the world. This here that we're in, this moment, is profoundly conservative. In fact, it's frozen. In your movie, one of the things that was fun uh, at the beginning of the movie was uh, your section entitled Two Truths and a Lie. And you have three different uh, writers tell the, the, the camera two truths and the lie, and you <clears throat> juxtapose them with each other. When you ask these uh, writers and academics to tell two truths and a lie, um, were you hoping to illustrate that it wasn't that difficult to pick out the lie, or were what what were you aiming to bring forward with that game? I think it's a good question. What what is added by it? I often don't know who, and it it was one of my film collaborators who came up with the idea, I think. Robin Hemley, I think, came up mm -hmm. with that idea. And he is one of the interviewers as well. And mm -hmm. to me, what's interesting at crucial moments, I don't know often who is telling, you know, when the lies, but sometimes, in my opinion, you can see in their eyes a little dancing light of lying. Like, I feel like there's fascinating tells that people do. Kind of like in my telling of Two Truths and a Lie, the way I paused or whatever, you could probably tell. Well, you, you waited a long time. I know what you mean. To tell that lie. So it you had so to pick up the lie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? And I think um, that, but anyway, like, I often don't know. Part of me, sometimes I would ask friends, like, okay, so which one's the lie? And of course they would never tell me because they were sort of clinging to the gamesmanship of it. Like, I'm not going to tell you which one is the, the lie for me. It's meant to be essentially, it makes no sense unless the precarity of it. Like I often can't tell the viewer can't tell. I sometimes tell myself I can tell because of the way that their eyes dance a little bit. Like at one point someone says, um, I'm deathly afraid of cats. You know, like she has a, a, a morbid fear of cats, she says. Not the musical, which would make sense, but, you know, right, a morbid right, right. fear of the animal. And she kind of overacts it because she's not a trained actor. She kind of goes, oh, I'm so afraid of cats. And I feel like in her overacting, in my view, she gives it away that that, that is the lie. It could be I'm totally wrong, but in my view... There's these tiny moments, or at one point this guy says that I have a desire to touch the antlers of of a of an animal. And he too overacts it, I feel like. Mm. And so for me, it's meant to be, it's really difficult to tell. I don't know how you read those moments. Well, you know, but what, to me, know, it's I meant to be if we think we can tell the difference between truth and a lie. Tell me how you parse all these because I can't tell. Well, okay, so the, the, there's two examples where you don't have to watch their eyes. You don't have to read their body language. You don't have to know them. You can just know which one's a lie. And one of them is the guy who says it rained today in Connecticut. Bob Dylan's father was named Abram Zimmerman, and the number 871 is a prime number. Well, it rained today in Connecticut could be a lie because that's an empirical fact I don't have any access to. Bob Dylan's father was named Abram Zimmerman. I can look that up. That's true. Then the last one, the number 871 is a prime number, is false. I can I can tell that just right, right away. So, <clears throat> or at least if I take out my calculator. Yeah. Um, and so he he was actually being very subversive in the way he did it because he he was um, telling you something that, that was a lie that uh, you should be able to tell necessarily just if you know what a what a prime number is yeah um the other the other person that did something similar he said, said the u.s sent humans to the moon the u.s is the richest country in the world the u.s produced the greatest novel in the english language okay well two of those statements are questionable the u.s is the richest country in the world um and the u.s produced the greatest novel in the english language um it, it, there's no way to judge the wealth of the United States historically across epochs. You, you can't compare the wealth of the Roman empire to the wealth of the United States because 
wealth is measured in a completely different way under capitalism and modernity than it was in the time of the, of the Roman Empire. Um, it's measured as basically based on the abstract labor time as a Marxist. That's what I would say. So mm-hmm. the um, so it's, that's the one that's the lie rather than the U.S. produced the greatest novel in the English language. And I say that not because you can really determine what the greatest novel in the English language would be, but rather when he says that it is, he must know that he's only stating his own aesthetic ju- judgment and taste, that there is no way to judge. I know what you mean. Yeah. So, so I believe that uh, just by understanding the, the answers, I can tell. But the way most people would play the game is they would tell you three things about themselves, personal facts. Yeah, like and, I sat next to Jackie Kennedy and didn't know it was Jackie Kennedy or whatever. Right, right. How could we possibly know? Um, right. Or right. I walk around with goats every day, like, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, t- so Doug, you say two truths and a lie. In order to understand what is at stake philosophically in our real life, in our society, politically, we should return again to comparing Joan is Awful to The Truman Show. In fact, a conventional criticism of Joan is Awful is called for at this point because to understand where this Black Mirror episode breaks down can lead us to understanding the imposed limitation we are living under in 2024. Toward the end of Joan is Awful, the main character, Joan, breaks into Streamberry, a company that is clearly standing in for Netflix, with the aim of destroying the quantum computer that is generating the fictionalized version of her life for the streaming service. When Joan breaks in, she finds Michael Sarah is manning the computer terminal and watching the footage of Joan is awful that the computer is generating. Only, instead of Selma Hayek's face, the Joan that Sarah is watching has Joan's face. Actually, Joan in Joan is Awful is played by Annie Murphy, an actress whose previous roles included playing the part of Alexis Claire Rose on Schitt's Creek. So the face on the screen isn't Joan's face, but the face of Annie Murphy. And Michael Sarah informs Joan that she is not the real Joan, not the source Joan, but is merely a computer-generated image based on Joan combined with the face of Annie Murphy. He says that on the level of reality they're on, Annie Murphy plays Joan, and Selma Hayek plays herself. Hayek only plays Joan on level two. Now, Selma Hayek objects to this explanation by insisting that she is not merely playing the part of Selma Hayek, but is, in fact, Selma Hayek. But Sarah explains, It tracks that you'd believe that because you're coded to play yourself on this level. They are in fictive level one. Hayek doesn't understand, and Sarah gets impatient. I mean, this is not called Salma Hayek gets everything explained to her, but doesn't understand it still. It's called Joan is Awful. It's her story, by which I mean the real her. I don't mean, I mean, I'm not any Murphy source Joan. The Joan that lives... <coughs> oh, thank God. You are so boring. Okay, so thanks for listening to all that, but now here's the problem. The explanation is inconsistent with itself. Presumably, the source Joan didn't discover her own face on the screen when she broke into the source reality version of the computer lab. She didn't encounter Michael Sarah. The real Joan wouldn't have had to insist that she was the real Joan the way that Annie Murphy tried to insist that she was. The way the scene plays out assumes that the fictive level one is both real and unreal, or it assumes that there actually is no source reality and therefore there are an infinite number of fake Jones going up and down on various levels forever. The scene as it is, is incoherent and breaks its own rules, given what we're asked to believe. And this is the dilemma we're all facing. We are all both the products of society and producing it. Reality as something interpreted rather than something that is immediate and bare is something we're constructing and that is constructing us. However, we are also being presented with an incoherent cover story that contradicts itself. We're asked to believe that there is a source reality that is whole and complete in itself, or, if you want to be subversive, we're asked to believe that there is no reality at all, and that even the source 
Joan, is merely a computer-generated image. We're asked to interpret the show in one of two ways. Either Source Joan is real, or nothing is. To get past our political crisis, we'll need to find a different interpretation, not a Black Mirror or Joan, but of what it means to be real. Neither crass empiricism nor deconstruction will overcome the paradox. Reason, the kind of simple reason that I tried to apply to this scene from Black Mirror, will have to be one of our primary guides. Seeing the contradictions, discovering what is untrue because it simply cannot be true, should, I think, be central to our attempt to discover the truth in this moment of Trumpist deconstruction and Democratic Party authoritarianism. So, Doug, you say two truths and a lie. Okay. Um, if you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.